I use this site? Can I trust it with my information? What's it going to do with it? Oh, hold on, I'll read the privacy policy. Oh, wait a minute here, there's pages of it! And what's it going on about? We store your data for as long as it's necessary to provide products and services to you and others. Well, that's very specific, isn't it? Oh, I just think I'll give up on trying to read it. And that, in summary, might well be the sort of experience that you and many others have had in relation to privacy policies on websites. They're now a standard feature of most sites, but they can differ significantly in the degree to which we can understand them, thanks to the volume of information and the complexity or the ambiguity of the language that's used. This podcast looks at the accessibility of the policies presented by some leading sites, looking at the length and reading ease of the associated texts, and the implications for the users concerned. A common context in which users are routinely posting and sharing sensitive data is within social networks. However, these are often contexts in which the same users tend to show little regard for privacy. To an extent, this may well be a reflection of modern life and changing attitudes, and that's certainly the view that the social networks themselves tend to promote. For example, back in early 2010, Facebook's founder Mark Zuckerberg made the statement shown here, suggesting that people really have gotten comfortable not only sharing more information and different kinds, but more openly and with more people. That social norm is just something that's evolved over time. If one looks at Facebook's own handling of the user's data, then it's clear that it's been giving this norm a bit of encouragement, with the default availability of personal data held on the site getting progressively shared with a wider group of people. At the time of recording, this is nicely illustrated by a graphic on Matt McKeon's website, the address of which is shown now. In practice, there are great variations in users' natural privacy stance and behaviours. Whereas some seem to protect their online privacy as a point of principle over practicality, others seem to want to share everything and anything with their online friends. Now, it's not a question of taking one side or the other here. The key thing is that people should have a sense of what's sensible and safe to share and then be able to take an informed position when doing so. The challenge is likely to be more acute for new and unfamiliar users who have yet to find a solid footing in their use of technology. This can of course include many adults, the so-called digital immigrants that have had technology thrust upon them rather than having grown up with it. However, in terms of understanding and dealing with privacy, another key audience is likely to be young people, especially given their tendency to embrace technology and remain fairly oblivious to its risks. Indeed, while it's been sometimes suggested that the next generation workforce are technology aware, it's also been highlighted that they can sometimes show a worrying disregard for both their own privacy and that of those they interact with. Now, linked to this point, the wider paper on which this podcast is based also takes a look at some survey findings produced by The Iron Online, a UK charity which provides a number of learning resources around data protection practice and awareness for schools. They undertook a survey of over 4,000 young people to explore their use of social networking and their awareness and use of privacy policies. And the full paper, which is referenced at the end of the podcast, draws upon some of these results to illustrate the extent to which policies consequently need to be accessible to a young audience. To be honest though, privacy policies need to be clear and accessible in order for any level of users to make informed use of the services. In order to look at the promotion of privacy in practice, let's look at the policies from a number of popular social networking sites, as listed on the slide. This covers a variety of popular sites and enables a comparison to be drawn between those that more explicitly address the young audience, such as Club Penguin and Bebo, and those that are more implicitly aimed towards adult audiences, such as LinkedIn. Given that these website policies periodically get updated, it's worth noting that all of the assessments here were conducted in mid-June of 2012, and so are based upon whatever version of the policy was current at the time. All of the sites have clear links to their privacy policies from their home page, and so users have the chance to read them before they log in or sign up. Mind you, in some cases they're not exactly linked to as prominently as the opportunity to get going and share data, as we can see with this example from the Facebook home page. I'll give you a moment or two to see if you can spot the link to the privacy policy. And in actual fact, this particular example is blessed with a couple of them, which is better than some other examples I could show. They're not exactly the most prominent links on the page, but at least if a user's going there with a privacy concern in mind, they don't have to look too far before they're likely to find something. Of course, while all of the sites have policies, this doesn't necessarily mean that people will read them. And very often it seems that the way in which the documents are presented will act as a disincentive to doing so. And of course if they're not read, then they certainly can't be understood. 
So for a start, it's worth taking a look at the overall length of the documents involved. And as we can see from the chart here, which ranks the policies as an ascending order of length, the amount of information that users are expected to read, or perhaps expected not to read, is very significant in some cases. The assessment considered the text from the opening title through to the final bit of useful information on the page, which was typically something like contact address, definitions, or the last revision date of the policy. Any other header and footer information that might have appeared on the web page was ignored for the purposes of getting the word count. Clearly, those writing some of the policies didn't feel that length ought to be a constraining factor on them, and if we want to draw some contrast here, it can be noted that several works of rather more significance than these policies have been achieved rather more briefly. For example, the Ten Commandments weigh in at just 179 words, and the Gettysburg Address was achieved in just 286. Now, as you may already be thinking, it's not all about length either. It's also worth considering how easily the text can actually be read and comprehended. In order to enable an assessment of this, each of the policy texts was run through the grammar checker feature of Microsoft Word, which usefully reports a couple of related metrics at the end of the testing. The first is reading ease, which refers to the readability of the text, and then the flash Kincaid grade level refers to the US grade level at which somebody would be expected to be able to read the text and understand it. So if we look at the table on the next slide, we can see how the various site policies actually fared against these criteria, as well as presenting another view of the comparison of the policy length. Looking then at the reading ease, it's worth noting that the scores in the range of 60 to 69 are considered to be standard here, and therefore an acceptable target to be aiming for. By contrast, the majority of scores in the table are in the realm of 30 to 49, and would consequently be judged difficult, and those scores below 30 would be formally classified as confusing. Meanwhile, if we look at the grade level, the score of 10.2 from the table would suggest that the associated policy text would be readable to an average 10th grade student, i.e. somebody aged 14 to 16 in the United States. When considering the grade level results in the table, it should be noted that Microsoft's Word grade level calculator doesn't return results above 12, so any text judged to be higher than this will still be reported as 12 in the results. Now, if we look at the scores that the various sites actually achieved, it's notable that Club Penguin, a site specifically targeting a young audience, has a very low score for reading ease and the same grade level as sites that are targeting predominantly adult users. Indeed, the readability scores of the sites don't appear to link well to the likely ages of their target users at all. Another observation here is that the readability of the text may not just be a problem for children, with prior findings suggesting that approximately half of the working adults in the UK have a reading age of 11 or lower. Some other aspects of the table also merit some further explanation. You may have noticed that some of the sites have multiple entries. This reflects the fact that some provide multiple policies with differing levels of detail and focus. For example, LinkedIn offered two variations of its policy, a full version and highlights, and hence these are shown independently in the table. Meanwhile, for MSN, a supplementary privacy policy is presented, in addition to the normal Microsoft Online Privacy Statement. As such, the additional details of the MSN supplement are included here, but it's conceivable that others, such as the Messenger and Windows Live supplements, could also apply in some contexts. The policy length shown in the table now gives the specific word counts that we use to inform the earlier chart, and to give a potentially more meaningful indication of what this means in practice, there's also an accompanying measure of page length. This refers to the approximate number of A4 pages that each policy would take up, with all of the policies having been formatted in 10-point aerial font and single line spacing in order to give a consistent basis for comparison. Given that their main policies are quite sizable, it's at least to be commended that MSN and LinkedIn provide the more accessible highlights versions. Twitter's policy is also worth a mention here for having three key points nicely flagged as tips for the reader, as shown here on the next slide. As you can see, although they don't convey the detail, they do neatly summarise some of the key considerations that users ought to be bearing in mind. Google, meanwhile, has worked to simplify its policy in recent times. If anyone remembers looking at it prior to March 2012, you'd have found a shorter main policy of around 1,650 words, but also a series of 60 supplementary policies that may have applied to the services you were using. For example, for users of the social networking features, a separate Google Plus policy added a further 1,000 words there. 
If we refer back to the table, though, it's worth noting from the reading ease and grade level measures that even short policies can remain hard to read and interpret. This, of course, has some knock-on consequences, and an illustration of this becomes clear if we take a look at the responses to one of the specific questions from the Iron Online survey that was mentioned earlier. Having asked the respondents whether they read privacy policies, a follow-up question was then posed to those that, perhaps unsurprisingly, said they didn't, in order to find out why. The responses are shown on the following slide. Now, although a variety of reasons are indicated overall, there's a clear message coming through between the two main age groups. While primary school children are, perhaps unsurprisingly, lacking an understanding of what the policy is, the predominant challenge facing the older and more aware secondary age respondents was the ability to actually interpret and understand it. This actually introduces a danger of early opinion forming for those so-called digital natives, with the risk that when they encounter links to privacy policies, or perhaps wider aspects of security and privacy in the future, they'll already be inclined to dismiss them as things they couldn't understand in the past. There's also the more general consideration that weak privacy practices established at this stage are likely to find themselves being transferred into the workplace at a later stage in life. Having highlighted the various difficulties that are to be encountered when trying to interpret the policies, it's worth stopping to consider whether this is particularly surprising anyway. Maybe they're not really expected to be meaningful to a general readership in the first place. Policies often need to be there to fulfil requirements from a legal perspective, and are typically worded accordingly. So from this viewpoint, it's arguably not really their intention to communicate the information clearly to everyday users. Of course, this doesn't leave the user in a very favourable position, and they still need something to help them understand if they're facing a privacy risk from a given site. Luckily, there are already things that they can look out for, without having to read the full extent of a policy. For example, a widely recognised indication for the privacy-aware user is to look for whether the site concerned has been awarded the right to display something like the trusty privacy seal, as shown on the slide. Displaying this trust mark signifies that the site's privacy policies and practices have been reviewed by trustee and comply with the requirements of their program. However, for this sort of safeguard to work properly, users need to be aware that they should be doing more than just looking. Approval by trustee means more than just displaying a graphic. In a properly approved site, clicking on the seal takes you to a page that provides details of their trustee license and the web addresses to which it applies. So users shouldn't take confidence from just the presence of the seal alone. They need to click to verify the details and then check that they're being taken to a genuine page hosted by trustee rather than a spoof page set up to mimic its behaviour. The use of such trust marks has a clear advantage for users as it gives them the opportunity to entrust the privacy assessment to someone else. So with this in mind, maybe that's what sites should be headlining rather than just a link to their privacy policies. At the time of the policy assessments described earlier, Club Penguin was displaying the seal on both its home page and the policy page itself, while LinkedIn and MSN had the graphic on their policy pages. Meanwhile, Facebook's policy made mention of trustee for dispute resolution, but they didn't display the privacy seal, thus preventing users from being able to perform the click to verify that they were encouraged to do on other sites. Meanwhile, for Bebo, Google, MySpace and Twitter, the policy made no mention of it at all. So from the assessment presented here, it's clear that there's some way to go before privacy concepts and policies are presented in a manner that truly supports the users. As it stands, many users are likely to be challenged to make properly informed decisions, and are most likely to place trust in the services simply because they know other people are already doing it, and they have some feeling of safety in numbers as a result. Good privacy practice is a wider lesson than these various social networking sites are really going to teach, and of course their business model relies upon users sharing as much as possible anyway. However, they should at least be giving users the fairest chance to understand what they're signing up to. There's certainly a place for all the legal phrasing that complicates the readability of the current doc, but if we really want users to make an informed decision about what they're doing, then they need to be given something more suited to their needs. On the positive side, the highlights, tips and supporting content that some sites already provide are at least useful steps in this direction. If you're interested in taking a look at the paper from which much of this material is drawn, then the details are shown on this slide. It was co-authored with my colleague, Professor Andy Fippin, and it appeared in the August 2012 issue of Computer Fraud and Security. And with that, it's the end of the session. Thanks very much indeed for listening. 
There are a variety of contact details on the final slide here, so please feel free to email me at sfennell at plymouth.ac.uk or to follow me on Twitter via at smfennell, but only if you're happy with the privacy policy, of course. Bye for now.